Welcome everyone. Um, we're Miami Freedom Project here again on this beautiful Monday, Earth Day, with someone who, you know, the stars had to align for you to fall on our Earth Day. We've been doing Earth Day events with Andrew Othasso, um of Miami Creation Myth and so much important work that's happening around the environment and climate in Miami. Um, since we started, I think every Earth Day we've done some kind of convening, activity, direct service. Um, You've asked me to do some really terrible things on Earth Day. I have, and you've done them. I've done them. You all should do them. Um, one of the things that I, I, I admire so much about Andrew is that he gets out there um, in the mangroves, in the garbage, in the muck, um, but you also understand the larger problem and what needs to happen next. So we're very happy to be here on this Earth Day with Andrew. Welcome, Andrew Othasso. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, so, like I said, we always do events together. I'd love to talk to you about the event we just did. Um, we were out in Little Haiti. We met at Little Haiti Soccer Park, um, found some fields to clean up. Um, we were joined by Ashley Toussaint, um, who is running Edge 305, who you should all um, go on Instagram and find the running club that they, they set off in different parts of Miami. Um, and he was very welcoming and invited us to be in the neighborhood that he loves so much. And I was, I was so appreciated the time not just the activity, but the understanding and the feeling um, that people in that community have for, for Little Haiti and for where they're from. Can you tell me a little bit about that event? What, is, what does it mean for you as somebody who's in there always doing direct service, always cleaning up for Earth Day? What does it mean when everybody descends on you and wants to help you? Uh, well, for a bit of background for your listeners or mm -hmm. if you're on YouTube, your watchers, your viewers, um, I've removed 24,000 pounds of trash to date from South Florida's coastal ecosystems. Um, and Wait, 24,000, does that include our 200 pounds from Saturday? That does not include those 200 pounds. So that's 24,200 pounds. pounds. Thank yes, you, Andrew. Those correct. were hard, hard ones. Yes, so they please, were. Please they were. Them. There was a tire. There, was a lot, there were multiple tires. Yeah. Um, but my work um, has expanded way beyond just cleaning up the mangroves or the Everglades. It's included partnering with local schools, so I go and talk to the students about the importance of uh, trying to mitigate plastic pollution in our waterways and in our ecosystems. And I've partnered with Ashley for years as well. Um, so he is the uh, assistant principal of a local school, so I've gone to talk to his school. His students have come out to the mangroves, and you know, we clean up the mangroves on Virginia Key. And I've worked with him in Little Haiti a couple other times um, on cleanups. He's like, for instance, on Haitian Flag Day. Mm -hmm. And the thing about uh, the trash that we find in our bay or in our mangroves or other, again, coastal ecosystems is that most of them start off on the street. Most of that trash starts on the street. Mm -hmm. So people just, you know, illegally dumping or just being careless and throwing their wrapper or water bottle on the sidewalk. And when it rains, that goes right into the gutter and there's no processing, there's no filtering at all, that goes right into Biscayne Bay and then that winds up in the mangrove. So it's much easier to pick up trash on the street, on a sidewalk, as you know, than you know over the natural obstacle course that is a mangrove forest. Uh, so I thought that for this Earth Day, we could partner with Ashley, with his, with his group, and we could pick up some parts of Little Haiti that could use some love that have been historically um, have not received the public services that they deserve. So that's what, exactly what we did. I mean, I think of all the things, and we've, we, we, you know, we have been working together in so many different projects since we start, launched Miami Freedom Project. No offense, but that idea that you just said has stayed with me. Um, it's probably something that I think of, if not daily, once a week, because I'm just in my neighborhood, deep in the city of Miami, and I'll see a bag and I'll just think, I'm going to have to clean it up anyway. It's going to yeah. be either today or it's going to be yeah. in six months when it gets to the Bay with Andrew. Right. So might as well get to it now. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think we realize that that happens. That's something that, that that one trash can that you see kind of like filtering out, that one bag that gets tossed over is going to end up in a duck's mouth or it's going to yep. end up in some kind of, you know, creating this just this like influx of just debris and that that's harming our, our oceans and our bays. Right. Yeah. And, and that piece of plastic does not remain one solid piece of plastic. So whether it's a Publix bag or a water bottle, whatever, once it falls into the ocean, 
over time, the UV rays of the sun, the wave action, breaks it down to smaller and smaller pieces of plastic, known as microplastics. And then the animals at the bottom of the food chain mistake that for food, and they'll ingest it. And then larger animals will eat the smaller animals until the animals at the highest, at the top of the food chain. So swordfish, tuna, have the highest concentrations of those toxins in their bodies, and those are also animals that we like to eat. But even, you know, ignoring that, for example, manatees, um, the way that they feed is that they use their front two flippers to kind of scoop up the, uh, the, the seagrass on the seabed, or they'll just kind of munch on it with their mouths. And all that microplastics, all those microplastics that have filtered literally to the bottom of the seafloor, they just, it goes right into their stomachs. Mm-hmm. Um, and it'll stay there. They can't digest it, and it'll it'll poison them essentially. Yeah. Well, when you talk about manatees, it goes right to <laughs> sword through my heart. Yeah. Because um, you think about when you think about we we think about the earth, we think about ourselves, we think about our friends, we think about our families. But when we think about harming a being like a manatee, mm-hmm. like just how vulnerable yeah. these ecosystems are to we have this capacity to not do this harm. Right. And not hurt the most vulnerable creatures that we are sharing this, space, this, this world with and that we can't bring ourselves to do that in, in a responsible, consistent way. Yeah. I think is something that we all have to, we just have to do better. We have to do better and we have to do right because right. it's all within our, our, our capability. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think when you talk about, to me what's always fascinating when we go out there with you that you'll take us out somewhere. And like, to be clear, sometimes I give you a hard time about location. Mm-hmm. We love the beach cleanups, but then those are beautiful and you get to see the water and it, it, it can feel very exciting. But then you'll be like, no, 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 we're going to go. To oh, yeah. This, like, we're going to go <laughs> into areas. in the back of a parking lot yeah. and throw a jump over a fence <laughs> and really just get to I've it. I've never made you jump over a fence Not per yet. se. But yes, I, I tend to focus on areas that other people ignore. So, you know, there are many great organizations in South Florida that do great work on the beaches, um, so many of them, and kudos to them. Um, so I, my niche is much harder to reach places. So mangrove forests, hardwood hammocks, the Everglades, places that people typically don't go unless they're dumping trash. Like, I don't know, the dozen tires that we removed from a hardwood hammock last year. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, those are the areas that I love. Those are the areas I like to go into and explore. And unfortunately, they're areas that don't get a lot of love. Um, they're not areas that get picked up very often. Yeah, and absolutely. And I think that the beach cleanup crews are incredible, and they're out there very consistently. And to everything that you described, it's essential. I, it, to me, what's always surprising is you go out there, you, you'll take us out to some field, and it takes me about 15 minutes before you win me over. And I'm like, okay, Andrew was right. It was, it was a good point. And I, I'll look at any space we're in and I'll think he was wrong. There's nothing out here. And then when you start looking mm-hmm. and we're out there for a few hours and it's a couple hundred pounds and yet you feel like you could have been out there for a oh, few more days yeah. and still not get all of it. Right. I couldn't believe even in that like the area, the lot that we were in on Saturday that as we were leaving, you're like, wait, but no, wait, but no. Cause there was just, there was so much. Right. Um, and it's in these layers. There's, exactly. there's this, it goes really deep and you see this, like, it's almost like you're looking at those cross sections where you're just seeing so yeah. many years of just pe- people being careless and also a lack of services. I think there are some neighborhoods where we think of someone's taking care of their neighborhood, some people aren't. No, some some neighborhoods are getting more services. Someone Absolutely. is getting, there's an investment in yeah. keeping those areas in a different way. It's not because people are, the behavior is different. It's, it's pretty much, it's the same everywhere. Yeah. It's just that some areas are going to have, they're going to have more pickups. They're going to have, you know, more accountability when somebody doesn't get out there in time. And I think we also have to be really mindful of that, that it's not, it's, it's hitting all of our neighborhoods, but it's not hitting them all in the same, to the same degree. No, absolutely not. Um, and, you know, we didn't just pull plastic bottles out of this field in little Haiti, we pulled, I, you know, I picked up a, uh, a fertilizer dispenser. Uh, that's a t- just, just toxin. Um, and a big, like giant, probably 15 pound, five gallon bucket of, uh, I believe it was caulking. Um, and you would never find that in Coral Gables. You'll never find that in Pinecrest. Then there's, there's a reason for that because the, uh, 
honestly, the powers that be focus on those areas because they perceive them as having more economic and more political power. And therefore, they ensure that their residents are, you know, receive uh, services like cleaning up these areas. Or they will institute fines for uh, um, either the, the businesses around them if they don't clean up their areas. Or they'll, you know, no one is going to, uh, you know, whatever, Hiralda in Coral Gables with a, uh, a, a pickup truck full of construction material mm -hmm. to dump on the street because yeah. they know that they will be arrested or they will be fined. Um, but that doesn't happen in many other neighborhoods in this city. Yeah, and like you said, it, it all ends up in the bay. And I think when you're out there on, in the water and you see the boats going by and you think about what people take to the beach and don't take back with them, they just, they just leave it out there, it, it's, it's all adding to this problem. It's just everybody, to me it's incredible because everybody, you, it's one act and then when you pull out, it can do so much harm. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are bad actors in any community. Mm -hmm. um, and most, say, like boaters are reasonably responsible individuals. But, you know, it just takes a couple people to ruin, absolutely ruin an area. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen the only in date videos of the Spoil Islands um, just being littered with trash, I can tell you that I've cleaned up a few spoil islands and I've cleaned up plenty of dump sites with the most heinous materials you could imagine, like literally a field of used diapers, um, like <laughs> dozens of used diapers, but all sorts of material, barbecue, like a literal actual barbecue, um, you know, those big canvas tents that people will pop up mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, Unfortunately, we don't have the enforcement that we need in this county to, one, stop people from going to these sensitive habitats, many of which are off limits, but two, ensuring that, you know, again, marine patrol can't be everywhere mm -hmm. um, or, uh, you know, other, other enforcement actors can't be everywhere, but, you know, a lot of these areas are just simply ignored. So can you tell me when did you start? What was the what what was pound number one? You're twenty four thousand two hundred. Yes. Now when did it start that you started to do this with this kind of intentionality? Started seven years ago, I think. I'm pretty sure it was seven years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it started in Bearcut Preserve on the northern coast of Virginia. Excuse me, on Key Biscayne. And it's an area that I have I, I had fallen in love with years before. I love that area. And I would go there seeking some sense of peace, some sense of solace, because it, it's the mangrove forest. If you've never been in a mangrove forest, it's just gorgeous. It's beautiful. It is unearthly. It's like nothing you've ever seen in your life. Um, there's so much wildlife there. Uh, there's so much ecological diversity. And I would walk into this preserve and, you know, trying to center myself, and I'd walk out furious. Um, just really, really upset because everywhere I stepped, I was stepping on a piece of plastic. Mm -hmm. um, it looked like a complete landfill. And nobody was doing anything about it. This was off the radar for most people. And very few people actually knew the magnitude of this issue. So, you know, almost as like me screaming into the void, I was like, well, you know what? If no one else is going to do something about it, then I'll start doing something about it. I just started picking up trash. And going back there regularly, it's a very simple process. You find the trash, put it in a bag, put the bag on your back, take it out. And I've been at it ever since. And it just started, you know, me alone. And almost on a whim, I brought a GoPro on a tripod. And I started recording it and putting it on social media. And people connected with it, which I never thought they ever, ever would. Because who cares about a guy in a swamp picking up trash? Um, I do. Thank you. You do. But, <laughs> uh, you, like. Andrew. A lot of people noticed, um, and uh, then over the years, I you know wanted to take this problem outside of an area that people aren't exposed to, because uh, most people never go into a mangrove forest. So I collected, my buddy and I collected 35 pounds of trash from the mangroves, and we constructed this trash bag, essentially, and connected it to a hiking bag and then I put that on my back, and I walked the length of the 2019 uh, Miami Marathon, all 26 miles, in nine hours 
and 50 minutes and it was horrendous uh very Sounds painful awful. it was awful it was absolutely terrible nobody should ever do that in case you're wondering um and then the, the next year we we put a team together and constructed this 135 pound trash cart that was shaped like a fish and we pulled that the length of the Miami Marathon, those two efforts combined raised over $30,000 for Miami Waterkeeper, which does great work uh, protecting our coastal habitats here. So since then, you know, it's expanded. I'm, again, I don't have an organization. Uh, I don't have a nonprofit. I'm literally just a guy is what I tell people. Um, and I've gone to speak to schools, to middle and high schools, the university level as well. And I've partnered with all sorts of organizations like yourself, um, like Love the Everglades movement, the Girl Scouts. We had a great cleanup mm -hmm. with the Girl Scouts. You get little patches. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, and that's, that's what I've been at. That's what I've been doing. And no, there's, in case anybody's wondering, there's no money in trash. Um, I've yet to monetize it. I have no plans to do it. It's just something that I love to do. And it's also worth noting you do these special events you do partner with organizations. You do a lot of work around Earth Day, but you're also out there when nobody's watching. Oh yeah, yeah. How often do you get do you get out there? Um, at my peak, I was out there like every weekend. Um, now I've had I've had to slow down a bit. I can't go out there quite as frequently because I just have so many other um, compromisos. Mm -hmm. What's the word for that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's Miami. Okay, compromisos. compromisos. Um, that I need to take care of. So maybe like once a month mm -hmm. now. Um, I would honestly love to be there much more often than that. I would love to be there during weekdays, but I have to work for a living, so I can't do that. Um, but yeah, that's about it. And you're one man, and you're taking a very singular action. I know that you don't have a nonprofit. You, you're still doing this, an individual just taking the next step to do what's right. How do you how are how do you engage with other organizations that are trying to attack this issue on a more systemic macro level? Um, a few different ways. So first and foremost, I'm a big proponent of finding your niche, mm -hmm. not trying to replicate others' work if they can do it better than you. So my niche is very simple. I can lead groups into the mangroves. I can physically pick up trash. I can talk to other people about that. That's about it. Um, but again, like the $30,000 that I raised, I could have very easily taken that and started my own nonprofit, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to, um, because I knew that Miami Waterkeeper could use that money to advocate, you know, at the state level or even at the federal level on, in a way that I couldn't. Um, so I've, again, I've, I've collaborated with so many different types of organizations. Um, another one is clean this beach up, you know, we'll go down to Elliott Key and partner with the the National Park Service and clean up uh, Biscayne Bay National Park. Um, love the Everglades movement out in the Everglades. I, these are all just different environments that I absolutely adore, mm -hmm. um, not just the mangroves. Um, and you know, I the the point of what I do, the picking of trash, um, is not an end to itself. So the point was never to remove all trash from Bear Cup Preserve or from other sensitive environments because. With every high tide, there's there's more trash. The uh, point was basically a long-running public relations campaign. So to use, for example, my efforts in the mangrove forests to bring attention to this issue um, that then draws more eyeballs to it, that raises its visibility so you know I can get on to the Miami Herald or um, on CNN or all manner of other outlets that I've been able to get onto and educate people about this issue and get invited to talk to schools um, or to different organizations, which is exactly what I've been doing. Um, and that's another way that I like to partner with organizations, spe specifically educational organizations um, or nonprofits, where I can speak to students, where I can speak to their parents even, and talk to them about why they should care about this issue. How did you engage, because you're speaking with students now, you grew up in Miami, correct? Right. Not, how, what was, how did you experience Miami when you were growing up? Were you, were you somebody who was always outside? Like, what was your connection to 
what our environment is where we're, we're outside right. there's sun there's beach like how did what what parts of miami did you love growing up that you're now working in so i've always been a recklessly curious person mm -hmm. my whole life since i was a child and like i just want to fill in the white space on the metaphorical map in my head so whenever i'd come across anything like uh, a trail or a section of beach or a mangrove forest. I was like, hmm, I wonder what's in there. And then mm -hmm. just go, you know, tromp, tramping into there, um, completely unprepared and get eaten alive by mosquitoes and cut up by all sorts of vegetation. And then I would learn that maybe I should bring pants and maybe I should bring a hat and maybe I should bring mosquito spray. Um, so that, you know, I was very lucky in that I was exposed when I was 13 to, you know, the mangrove forest. And where most people would think, man, I really don't want to walk into that mud and uh, God knows what's in there. Um, so I'm going to avoid it. I thought, I really want to see what's in there. That's literally like every time that I'm driving through anywhere, it doesn't matter any natural area, like a forest in, in Massachusetts where I was just a week ago or just through the Everglades, my instinct is, wow, I really just want to walk into this area where mm -hmm. there's no trail and just see what, what's in there. Um, so that, that's how that started. Nice. So when you're talking to, to students, how, are, what, how do those conversations go? Like, what is their like, awareness when you walk in? What are their questions? How are they understanding climate in a way that might be different than when we were growing up? It depends on the age of the students. Um, typically, they like when you're talking to middle school or high school students, they have a limited exposure to a lot of these issues. They might broadly know about climate change, but they don't know about the extent or the magnitude and seriousness of uh, marine plastic pollution. Um, so they're typically very responsive um, and just very, you know, from, again, I'm giving the presentation, so I'm not in their minds, but mm -hmm. they seem to be interested in it. And they ask very good questions, um, specifically, what can they personally do? What are the most important um, barriers to addressing this uh this issue and my message to them is always like you have ever you have all the tools you need you have mm -hmm. all the tools you need do you have a phone in your pocket do you have an internet connection that's literally everything you need there's nothing special about what i do all i do is very simple rote work and i record it and i publish it on social media that's it you can do the same thing for whatever topic you care about again my issue is marine trash but there are a million other systemic societal issues that are facing children nowadays that they can take the lessons that I've learned from my experience and apply to their own. Um, when, it talks to, when I talk to college or graduate students, um, there's like a sense of almost, again, I'm generalizing here, um, and it depends on the group of students that I'm talking to, but there might be a sense of paralysis um, just that the magnitude of these issues are so great and so existential that they feel like essentially uh, the world is doomed and there's nothing they can do to fix it. There's nothing that they can personally, there's no action they can take um, that will you know, in any way better their chances of surviving an upcoming climate or ecological disaster. Um, and so my job in those instances is to talk about the science um, yes, climate change is a massive, massive problem, and we are facing so many other ones um, that are destroying these very sensitive natural habitats, but it is not all doom and gloom. Um, there are steps you can take, and specifically what I tell everyone, and I mean literally everyone I talk to, it doesn't matter how old they are, is that you need to get involved politically. Um, so I can post, and I can march, and I can rally until I'm blue in the face, and you've heard me give this talk, but unless you get involved in legislation and regulation, mm -hmm. nothing is going to change, full stop. So the sooner you can get involved, you can tell your elected official, this is an important issue for me, what are you doing about it? The sooner they will feel the pressure from the grassroots to start to address it. I'm so happy that you brought that up. You know, Miami Freedom Project, so we don't, there's so many amazing organizations that are out there every weekend doing these cleanups. 
one of the reasons that we love partnering with you isn't because we're suddenly going to become a cleanup organization, but it's another way to raise awareness of the problem. When you're out there, when you're seeing something, when you're living it, when you're like me and you kind of think like, oh, this isn't too terrible, and then you see all the layers and how, how far it goes, or when you are in those mangrove forests and there is just this sense of you're, you're breathing within this forest and you realize what an important essential purpose that they serve for all of us and you feel very protective. Or when you're describing manatees, these like peaceful, loving creatures that we can't bring ourselves to, to protect. Mm -hmm. It's one way of understanding the problem, but you always hope and you hope that people will have the information that they need to take it to that next step and pursue a legislation, legislative policy solution. So what are some ways where people can become involved or story, like campaigns that they can track? Because we always hear about Florida, we talk about the climate crisis as 50 years, 30 mm -hmm. years. We're already experiencing it here yes, in Florida. So what right are immediate, some immediate issues, policies that we need to be aware of if people do want to hold their municipal, state, federal um, representatives accountable. Right. So, yeah, Florida has a horrendous um, history of disempowering local governments uh, from instituting their own environmental protection policies. So, uh, you know, in terms of the areas that I focus on, uh, the state does not allow municipalities or counties to implement, say, a plastic bag ban or, or a styrofoam ban. Um, that's, you know, that's a legislation that passed a few years ago. So if you're Miami Beach, you can't, you know, you can't do what D.C. or Boston or New York does, which is uh, simply inf enforce or, or make businesses charge a couple of extra cents for a plastic bag, which will then disincentivize people from taking a plastic bag. Um, so that's that's what I focus on in terms of just marine trash. But, you know, it's just a litany of different policy issues that the state disempowers. You know, in the free state of Florida, you know, you're supposed to be, uh, you know, you're, suppo you're supposed to be or live in an area that is free from government control, and yet the the state government will absolutely not empower their local municipalities to do anything to address environmental issues. Um, there are some bright spots. So we live in Miami-Dade County. Mm -hmm. There was a fertilizer ordinance that was passed, which is great. Um, so this we're, we're jumping to another t topic here, which is actually it, it crosses a few different uh, policy lines. But so we have seagrass bed die off here in Biscayne Bay, which is just catastrophic. And part of the reason why is because you have all this fertilizer runoff and septic waste runoff um, that's going into our waterways that just completely just throws the local ecological, um, like finely tuned balance out of whack. Um, so that's one issue that's good. There's, a, there's an upcoming bond. There's a $2 billion, $2.6 billion bond coming up uh, for in Miami-Dade County to implement a whole bunch of very important environmental mitigation efforts, including the septic to sewer transition. Um, but again, it's, it's not just, I, I, I don't like to just simply focus on environmental or marine mm -hmm. trash efforts. Uh, it's, it's statewide on a whole range of different topics. Like there's a, there's a reproductive rights uh, a ballot initiative that's on the the ballot coming up um in november specifically because we now have well it's in it's currently in the courts but florida has on the books a six-week you know abortion ban um and it, it's it's just the product of basically we have a one-party state now mm -hmm. and they can run roughshod and that's what they do yeah and I, and i do think there's so many ways to get involved there's a ballot initiative that you just described we're launching a Medicaid expansion ballot initiative more locally in Florida. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, recently we had, we saw HEAT, um, B HB 443 got signed into law. Right. Which made it, like you said, impossible for, preempt, preempted 
a local municipality that is experiencing that heat to be responsive to it in a way that they're going to ensure the safety of our labor force. And I do think it, that touches upon labor rights when we think about housing, when you're not, being, when you're not able to find a home in Alapada, in Liberty City, in Overtown, in Little Havana, any of these high ground areas that people used to be able to access, uh, access affordable housing, that is climate. That is because properties that weren't valued are now being seen as valued because they're on high ground. And there's not, there's not that accessibility point. Mm -hmm. And I do think we're, we're used to, when we think about migration, when we think about who's coming into, into South Florida, what Puerto Rico experienced, these killer hurricanes. We have so much, we have climate migration when people are no longer safe where they are and they have to find safe, you know, they have to find safe harbor from, from these climb, from these killer hurricanes that we've right. been every, every year. I think we all think, you know, I, I know that I look around my home and I always think, yeah, this could be gone. This could be gone. I mean, when it comes to hurricane season, I think that's the closest analog that we can experience in the modern age here in the United States to an invading army. Mm hmm coming into your country and not knowing exactly where it's going, but wherever it's going, it's going to obliterate everything. Um, and so I'm glad you brought up climate uh, migration and climate gentrification because we see that on the local level all the time, right? So you just brought up a whole bunch of neighborhoods that are being gentrified, that are being developed for um, a different subset of individuals that have historically lived there um, you know, with higher means. Um, but on a personal level, my parents are refugees, and so are yours. Um, you know, they fled a country that uh, just, the it collapsed around them. And Miami became my home. It is where I'm grounded. It is my, it is my motherland. I only have so much connection back to Cuba. But I don't want to be the next generation of refugee. I would really, really, really like to, you know, live in my parents' home and then hand that off to the next generation if I have, if I have children. Um, I'd really like to lay down roots. I don't want to have to move. I really, really don't. I don't want to be unmoored like that, um, culturally, physically, uh, emotionally, like my parents were, like my grandparents were. I want to live in a place that will be here in 50 years. I have a very, very strong vested interest in that. And I don't know if that's going to be the case. No, I mean, I, I definitely hear that and I feel that. And I think so many of us, to me, what I, I'm, I'm hearing more often is, well, they can't afford to live here, so they're going to, they, they're going to start their lives somewhere else. And I think about the parents, the grandparents, who aren't able to have, because I think culturally, I think it is so important for us to have a multi-generational experience. That's how we relate to the world. It's, it's, a, it's a foundational experience for us, how we, how we choose to operate. And that's, that's becoming less and less the norm. It's becoming less and less accessible because of things like climate displacement, that people can't be and exist in the place that they feel most connected to. Um, is something that we should all care about and we should all think about it as we're experiencing it right now here first. And there is so much that we can do still. Mm -hmm. And to have that awareness and to have that accountability, when you think about, you know, to what you said, there's so many intersections. When you think about tenants' rights, being able to keep people in their homes, that's, that's climate. That's, that, those pressures are coming because of the climate price crisis, but the solutions are coming in all of these other policies that are problematic or being put out of our reach for different forces, for people, you know, having other imperatives or other priorities that they're putting ahead of what people need to be able to live and work and raise their families in a place that they love and right. that they feel a part of. Yeah. Um, so I definitely appreciate everything that you're doing. And to me, what's so interesting about your work, because you do that direct service piece, you're out there, nobody can look at Nobody can say it can't be done when they see that you're this one man out there in the mangroves doing it. It definitely feels like you should you 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 want to be a part of that solution, but you also do a lot of different kinds of you communicate your experience of being a Miami man and how and and, and I respond to it creatively and also through satire through 
Yes, through very straight communications, <laughs> op-eds, thoughtful policy um, and analysis. Memes. And, but you also do it a lot through memes yes. and articles. And can you tell me, we were talking a little bit about it today. I got, I, I see something and sometimes I get the, I'll, it's in my inbox on Mondays and I'm just like, what? <laughs> and it's like, it'll be like the bro or like, <laughs> it's like the headline is something that I'm like, oh, that's Miami creation. Uh -huh. So can you talk to us a little bit about Miami creation myth, which you are also um, the, the person behind that? Right. So Miami creation myth started off as a book and it has become a monster. Um, so essentially, I wrote a book called The Miami Creation Myth. It won, a, it won an award. It's an International Latino Book Award for Best uh, Fantasy Novel. It's a satire. It's a humorous book. It's about Miami, obviously. It's essentially just like how the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians have their own gods and goddesses, their own legends. I did that for Miami. So it's a parallel universe that's literally just Miami-Dade County. And no one knows what's you know, north of the Broward County border. It's just this frozen tundra across a giant chasm. Um, and so I created all these, yeah, it's like a cultural chasm and, and, and a psychological chasm. Um, <laughs> and I created all these myths, right? So how did, uh, how was the world created? Um, how did, how were the sun, moon, and stars created? How did the f different communities come to live in Miami? And then the second half is called the Gafacito Odyssey, where my two hero twins, Marta and Coquita, have to travel to the different kingdoms or communities in Miami and collect the constituent parts of Cafecito to wake everybody up. So it started off like that, but <laughs> it, has, it has morphed into so much more. Um, so there's a meme page and there's a satire page. Um, I've, I th believe I'm like at 36,000 followers across platforms. Um, so I needed to build an audience for this book and I needed to, for people to understand that, you know, I'm the guy you go to for Miami humor and Miami satire. So what's a great viral piece of content that, you know, travels very well um, and gets you a lot of followers, memes. So I just cranked out over so many years, thousands of memes. Um, and then I started writing these satirical or humorous essays about different aspects of Miami. So some of them are more serious, uh, talking about the environment. There's always a, I can't, I can't really write anything with a purely serious voice. Uh, it, all, it always turns into satire. But relatively serious about like climate, for example. Or completely just like bonkers and you know, very esoteric, deep dives into very specific Miami things. So you got in your inbox today a piece about the many meanings of Miami's bro uh, as a pronoun. Um, so it's one of my favorite words um, used throughout the city. It is completely gender neutral. Um, you use it for you know your sister and your mother, and it doesn't matter what sex or gender or anything that they are. Everybody's a bro. Like, come on, bro. Like, why are you do why are you doing this to me, bro? Um, but it has so many different layers to it. So I like I like digging very deep into these very esoteric, these very semantic particular bits of Miami's culture um, and, and dissecting them um, almost like a researcher would and, and, and surfacing all of the different meanings behind them. So I did another piece on the many meanings of dale, the many meanings of coño, like all sorts of different uh, phraseology that we use here in South Florida and all sorts of other things that you know I'm constantly talking about are crazy traffic or um, the fact that no one can afford to live here, or how our uh, local commissioners are absolutely out of their minds. Um, so yeah, and that's, that's, that's since morphed into what it is, uh, a social media meme page and satire page, a weekly newsletter that goes out, and now we're in development for a, a TV show for, based off the book. So we're doing that now, um, because I don't have enough to do in my life. Absolutely, and in your regular, no, I don't, I don't. I don't know that you have a regular life. I think it's all kind of different. I don't know how to describe it. You are a communications professional. Yes, I have a communications agency called ARO Communications. I have clients who pay me to help them with their public relations, their media relations, to build their communication strategy. That's mostly how I make my living. And when I'm not doing that, I'm doing my immigration myth work. Uh, I had two events last yesterday, um, and then. When I'm not doing that, I'm in the mangroves picking up trash. 
I just realized I should have asked you to wear your croqueta outfit. You also oh, the do croqueta. panels in a croqueta outfit. I, I am doing a panel at Books and Books on May 14th with a whole series of very accomplished climate professionals, journalists, researchers, uh, heads of you know local community organizations, and I'm making them all dress up um, because uh, during the Miami Book Fair, um, I dressed up as a croqueta to be on a panel that was packed for some reason. Um, and I convinced my friend Mario Riza, who's a climate journalist, and very wrote... Very serious climate journalist. Very, yeah, very, very serious. Effective, serious. Literally climate. wrote the book on Miami climate change called Disposable City. I convinced him to dress up as a croqueta. And we were just two croquetas on a panel <laughs> with no peripheral vision because it was a cardboard cutout. And every time... Uh, you know, we had any of the other panelists talked. We had to move our whole bodies in unison. Mm -hmm. And two croquetas doing that apparently was really funny <laughs> because everybody in the audience was laughing. And I'm all about communicating in ways that are effective. And if you're dressed as a croqueta, at the very least, people will pay attention to what you have to say. And I have to ask, because you, you can do both. Like, so, like some people, like, they're, they're only first or feel strong in one area you under you you see both approaches what can you say as a croqueta that you can't say <laughs> as a serious communications professional and vice versa like the funny thing is that i can say literally everything i would say as a serious climate professional um the thing is the only difference is that the audience knows i'm coming from an authentic point of view they know that i understand them because if I were to do this in Philadelphia, everybody would just look at me and be like, why is mm -hmm. he dressed as, what is that, a hot dog bun or something? But I'm doing it in Miami. So it means that I'm part of your community. I understand these weird things and I'm, I'm weird enough to come up to this stage in front of 150 strangers mm -hmm. dressed as a croqueta and talk to you about why we need to maintain a 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, or below that level of uh, global warming or we're all screwed. Yeah. Um, so that, that's really, I'm delivering the same message. It's just people know that one, I, I don't take everything that seriously even if I'm delivering a very serious message and two, I'm one of them. I mean, I do think that works on a lot of levels because if you're dressed like a croqueta and you say something that's nonsense, people are like, well, what do you expect? It's a croqueta. <laughs> if you're brilliant, then they're like, wow, that croqueta. That's a smart croqueta that's out there. That's a smart croqueta. Yeah. So there's, there's, no, there's no loss there. There's yeah. no drop off there. But I also think it speaks to, it cuts through a noise that we have, you know, to what we said earlier. We've, my entire life, I remember Andrew really well. Mm. Don't need to say when when it when it hit us but you do live with you've had we have normalized an existential threat mm -hmm. if you live in yeah. miami there's parts of the world where you do think there's a season of maybe here maybe not yeah and to some extent i think that helps us understand the climate crisis and it also helps us maybe not understand the urgency of it because we've already normalized the worst of it yeah and the survivability of it but then also not necessarily understanding where those goalposts are going to keep moving. And it's, it's not every there's, there's always the potential for it becoming worse and worse and worse. It's right. not what we grew up with. This is, this is something different. Right. Um, and I do think it cuts through the noise in a way that people can connect with of this is coming from within our community because nobody else would understand why. Mm hmm. A croquetas Why is a croqueta outfit? talking to me about climate change? Specifically, so I was talking about climate communication. Mm -hmm. um, here's the thing. And this is, this is what the panel is at Books and Books in May. What, what it's about is how can Miamians help themselves through this process, through this climate change process. Um, my, what I bring to the table, I'm not a scientist, I'm a communicator. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am, I think, I'm pretty good at communicating complex and esoteric messaging in a way that people can understand it. It's not dumbing it down, it's just being more efficient at communicating that. And typically speaking, a lot of very specialized, very smart people, scientists, technocrats, mm -hmm. are terrible mm -hmm. at speaking to anyone outside of their little circle. 
And that might just be other scientists. Mm -hmm. That might be other people within their field. They use a lot of jargon. Um, they it, And it's just not fun. It's not interesting to hear them speak, even if what they're saying is very important, because for lack of a better term, they're extremely boring. Um, so if I'm able to, like I wrote a whole series on how Miami can save itself from climate change, and I'm talking about very technical things, about mm -hmm. what does a living seawall look like, and you know what are the different layers to it, and how should it be built, and who should fund it. But if I'm throwing jokes in there constantly, at least that's the sugar that helps the medicine go down. And that's what I do. Um, I try to deliver messages like even with my memes, like what am I talking about? I'm talking about, again, climate gentrification. I'm talking about history, deep-seated racial inequalities in this city that go back half a century, go back far more than that, actually. Um, I'm talking about very serious topics that most people's eyes just roll to the back of their heads if they're not, they're not already engaged with it. Um, but I do it in a format, and I do it with a tone that will keep people's attention. That's what I like to do. Like, give me the most boring subject in the mm -hmm. world and ask me to make it funny, and that's where I am happiest. And I will bring you some bonkers ideas. Great. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> You've seen me in action. No, look, and I think to what you, you know, to what you just said, I think it's also, we think of the climate crisis, and we should take it deadly serious. It is getting worse. There, the window for taking meaningful action is there, but it's closing, and it's every, every day it's less so. Um, so we have to be very mindful of what we can do as individuals, the accountability of holding the people who represent us who can make these decisions at the scale that meets the challenge and the threat, um, where it can be met and addressed in a meaningful way, absolutely. There's an opportunity here, I think, you know, to what you just said, to what our experience in Little Haiti, the way we've operated in these silos, this doesn't allow for that. This mm -hmm. is all of us. If yeah. you have a bazillion dollar home looking overlooking the bay, or if you're in Coconut Grove, if you're in Brickell, congratulations. I got some news for you. You're at the front line. Yeah. And you should be as invested in what someone is experiencing in Liberty City, who's losing their home and being displaced. This idea that this 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 crisis in particular is not going to touch all of us is it's yeah. completely untrue. Yeah, it is going. It is affecting all of us. It's affecting our quality of life. It's affecting our sense of of well being in a city that I think we all love for having come here as a refuge. This is the lifeboat. Mm -hmm. How are we going to shore it up and ensure that everyone is able to reach safety? is also the opportunity. If we can have that sense of how we're interconnected and in resolving this crisis, have that be the guiding force as opposed to these very, what I think of very short-term gain, long-term devastating irreparable loss. If, if, you're, if you're a power that, a power that be, and I don't even know if that's the correct term for it. If you're one of the powers that be and you want, you want to uh, continue a policy that is advantageous to you, but hurts uh, individuals on the grassroots level, the best way to do it is to pit, indi like, pit segments of the grassroots against each other. You've seen this for centuries mm -hmm. um, on racial terms, class terms, neighborhood, ethnicity. That's how, you know, once you get your, pot you, you keep people dis disunified, disjointed. Um, and you have them fight amongst themselves and they will not fight you. Mm -hmm. They will not try to tear down or reinvent or at the very least reform whatever system led to all of these different externalities that are affecting them negatively. Um, and that's what we see. So guess what? The sun shines on everybody regardless of how much money you make. Um, the water, water doesn't care like what, your, what, what graduate school you went to. Um, you could live in Edgewater and be directly affected by it, or you can live in Westchester, or you can live in Sweetwater and be directly affected by it. It doesn't care. It does not care. And if we in Miami, you know, want to make this city be anything other than this crazy, 
opulent wasteland that's just literally a few islands um, of of high-rise luxury condos that service from people serviced by people driving in from Ocala. Um, if we want the city to be anything other than that, then we have to actually do this all together. It really the great thing about my work that I've noticed is that it doesn't like it's it's non-political. Mm -hmm. Like it, it doesn't matter if you're a monarchist or an anarchist. Like these issues impact you. Full stop. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I wanted to make sure that we get, especially from you, our message from Miami. It's a series of questions that we ask all of our guests, and I'm very excited to see what oh boy you're gonna come up with okay um so our first question that we ask is you know i think we've 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 you know kind of laid out what what some of the issue problems are what is miami doing right oof uh, okay i need to switch my start with the positive what is miami doing right <laughs> um okay let me think about this one it's still a place, it is, it is, it is a place that is 70% Latino, it is 18% black, and the remainder, you know, white or other ethnicities. It is, it is a place where, you know, personally, it is the only place on the planet I've felt I didn't need to explain myself to anyone. That you don't need to explain I do that. not. Like, I can walk into any store, and people hear my accent, and, you know, when they ask, oh, where's your family from, there isn't, like, a undertone of, like, of, like, um, exclusion. Um, it's, it's culturally, and there, again, this is a huge generalization, but it is somewhere I feel completely at home. Um, and it celebrates many different cultures, many, many different cultures. Um, so like when I speak Spanish, you know, my accent isn't just a Cuban Spanish. Like I use, I've borrowed words from Dominican Spanish and Colombian Spanish. And, you know, I grew up listening to dance hall um, on Power 96 mm -hmm. um, and, you know, eating Haitian food. And there's all these different, it's this like wonderful cultural mix um, again, not saying that Miami is ne necessarily a melting pot because communities are definitely separate from each other, but there's this level of celebration of these cultural differences that I have not found anywhere else in the world. Okay. What is Miami doing wrong? And you're going to have to, we've, we've covered a lot of that. <sighs> so you can keep this. Okay. Just let's just, let's just cut to the chase here or go right to the, the root cause here. We elect bad politicians. Um, whether, you know, there's, there's good ones too, but if you've ever listened to a, a city of Miami commission meeting or a county commission meeting or, you know, Miami Beach commission meeting, it's a clown show. It is ridiculous. You have, and I'm not gonna name names, but you have commissioners that are just in it because they want their corner table at a restaurant, they want people to recognize them on the street, and they want to hand out money to their friends or family that are connected, and they want to stack pensions until they, they, they retire. And they don't have Miami's best interests in mind. We keep electing them. We keep doing it over and over and over again because that's the guy that we've had, and it's usually a guy. Um, and you know, better the devil you know than the one you don't, I guess, or it's just habit. Um, but just, we need to be more politically engaged and we need to understand that the people that we elect into office need to be held accountable for God's sake, please hold them accountable. All right, well, I think that's fair and I look forward to maybe voting for you one day, Andrew. Don't do that to me. <laughs> what is your most nostalgic Miami memory? planting fruit trees in my yard with my dad and my grandfather. Um, we planted dozens of trees. Mameyes, mangoes, sapote, avocado, uh, citrus before the canker killed them all. Um, 
And to this day, like I go to visit my parents and I see these enormous mame trees Mm -hmm. or uh, this giant avocado tree or a lychee tree. And I know that my grandfather who's passed away and my dad and I spent weeks and months and then years taking care of these plants. And now they're giving us the fruit or they're giving us those mames or mangoes. And it's just like, I don't know, it's, it makes me extremely happy. What do you miss that Miami used to have? Oh, God. What did Miami used to have? I'm not one for nostalgia, but there's so many areas that had so much more character Mm -hmm. now that have been kind of just blasted into this corporate soullessness. And I'm thinking of Wynwood. um, And... It's so many other areas that just like nothing means anything. Little Haiti too. Um, there's cer- certain sections too. Like my friend's dad had his own mural up for decades, and the the building got sold, and the owner had no reference to why this man was important to the community, and painted over it. Just mm-hmm. painted over it with this this stupid mural that means nothing. There's no cultural connection to this city. And that happens everywhere. That's happened in Overtown. That's happened in Little Haiti. That's happening in Alapata, in Opalaka. You see it in all these neighborhoods that had, continue to have, that are fighting for like their very cultural existence. And what do developers want to do? They just want to build some stupid glass and brick monstrosity that's, you know, 12 stories high, that has no connection to local history whatsoever, that's pushing out locals uh, by driving up rents. And you walk in, you walk down the street, and I'm thinking to myself, am I in D.C.? Am I Mm -hmm. in Boston? Am I in New York? Am I in freaking Brooklyn? I can't tell that I'm in Miami, other than the fact that it's 85 degrees outside and humid. If you were to leave Miami, and please don't, (sighs) what would you miss the most? That sense of cultural belonging. Again, like, you know, I I'm just me. I'm here. I don't I don't need to explain myself. I'm I can be a hundred percent me. I can dress up as a croqueta to (laughs) to a really important (laughs) climate change panel (laughs) surrounded by, you know, freaking PhDs. And everyone's like, that's hilarious. Um, and they get it. I, I, they just get it. I don't want to lose that. I don't want to lose that. What do you want Miami to look like in 20 years? I want there to be a functioning public transportation sector. Mm-hmm. Um, I want there to be buses that run on time. I want there to be a metro rail that goes beyond just a couple of lines, that goes out to Miami Beach, that goes out to FIU, that people can actually use. I want this city to be designed for, this is insane. This is crazy. It's never been done. Mm-hmm. Miamians. Mm-hmm. I want that. I want our politicians and developers to place their constituents' best interests first, not you know moneyed out-of-state interests. Like, you know, cool. Ken Griffin wants to build a massive tower on Biscayne Bay. All right, cool. That's great. But that's not going. That's not going to help Miamians. Like, I want them to focus on, rather than building the next of their series of 20 stadiums or a $380 million freaking spider bridge to nowhere, how about you actually invest that money into the communities and you help the people actually living here? Okay. Um, our last question is extra credit, but I don't think you need to answer it because you have answered it. It's If, if Miami was a novel, what would the plot be? And I don't want to miss this opportunity to tell people about your book which we didn't bring oh Miami creation myth sure Miami creation myth I read it we've had a discussion about it we were a previous panel I did not get the croqueta treatment which I'm a little mad about sorry um but you can get this book books and books by local by local Miami creation myth um can you tell me where else it's available uh, it's available, um, like you said, at Books and Books, at Sweat Records, at Martha of Miami, um, and if at you know if you can't go to any of those locations or you don't live in Miami, it's also available on Amazon. Um, that's 
Amazing. Great. Please do that. Also, how can they subscribe to your newsletter so they can wake up with like oh, a yeah. breakdown of bro and, <laughs> yeah. and uh well you can follow uh you can follow me on social media. So you can you on Instagram it's at Miami Creation Myth. Um on Twitter, uh just at Andrew Odassel. Um or you can go to MiamiCreationMyth.com. You'll be prompted by a guy in a speedo asking if you want to input your uh your email and if you do then uh you'll be on the newsletter and you'll get the newsletter every week okay nice so look for the man in the speedo yeah don't avoid eye contact (laughs) get that newsletter yeah um thank you so much andrew i feel like earth day is our anniversary we always (laughs) it 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 always starts small but then it it ends up you know we do more and more together and i'm so happy that you're here and that you're doing this work and that you've inspired me to do, to be a part of it, and that you've welcomed so many of us to join you out there. So thank you. My pleasure. All right. Thank you. Um, Please join us in a couple of weeks. We'll be back out here with Miami Freedom Project speaking to another amazing group from Florida Student Power Network that's doing incredible work in Miami. All right. That's it. We're good.